You're listening to Innovators by bcjobs.ca, Western Canada's largest job board. This podcast is about innovative companies with a focus on people. What sets them apart in terms of their leaders, company culture, and future outlook? As a business leader, what can you do to encourage innovation? As a recruiter, what can you do to adopt an innovative corporate culture? And as a job candidate, what can you do to stand out? Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Simon and I'll be your host for today's episode with Ragwa Gopal from Innovate BC. Ragwa is currently the president and CEO of Innovate BC. Aside from that, he has a whole list of other uh, positions that he is uh, currently on, including the governor at the University of British Columbia, and also a member at the Emerging Economy Task Force with the government of BC. I don't think any introduction I can ever give to Ragwa will be enough. I'll pass the mic over and I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, Maybe tell the people in the audience who you are and what you do. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Happy to be here. Uh, As as you mentioned, uh, my name is Ragwa Gopal. I'm the president and CEO of Innovate BC. I have taken this job uh, around early last year. So I've been at Innovate BC since uh, February uh, 2019. Prior to that, uh, you know, very briefly arrived in Kelowna in 1979 as a software engineer um, and uh, uh, with a co-founder, uh, f- co-founded the very first uh, software company in Kelowna, um, owned and built that company until 2001 and then uh, helped a couple of other startups and exit. And then uh, basically focused my time for about 15 years in building a tech ecosystem in the Okanagan region, help uh, build a local accelerator here in Kelowna. And then in 2015, uh, due to some changes and the accelerator, I actually uh, took the lead and became the president and CEO for Accelerator Okanagan, which is the, uh, the local technology accelerator. Headed that organization until, like I say, uh, February of, uh, of last year, and then now I've moved uh, uh, in Innovate BC. You're part of the board member for many different organizations. I'm just going to walk through some of them just so the audience can get a sense of how many different organizations uh, you're with. So you mentioned uh, you are the governor uh, at the UBC? Yes, so I'm one of the uh, province-appointed uh, governors uh, for UBC. And what does that role kind of look like? So, uh, you know, being a governor is like a, a director on the board. So we make sure that we provide the uh, the right kind of governance and strategic directions to uh, the university, to the administration team. And the UBC, from, from what I've uh, seen, I actually went to UBC as well. It's uh, one of the top schools in Canada and uh, even around the world. It sure is. And it's uh, trending, uh, you know, to become one of the... Uh, uh, I think it's already in the top 30, but trying to get uh, even in the top 20. It's an amazing, large, complex organization. Yeah, I believe as of 20, 2014, when I left uh, UBC, when I graduated, they were ranked 25th. So you're absolutely right, top 30 around the world and uh, probably trending upwards. And uh, in addition, you were part of uh, a couple of task force at the government of uh, British Columbia. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so a couple a year and a half ago, the province uh, instituted a emerging economy task force to uh, kind of look at uh, you know where the economy will be over the next five, ten, fifteen, even twenty five years down the road, uh, and um, you know provide guidance and assistance to the provincial government so they can start to institute policies uh, to make sure they're prepared you know for those economies that uh, you know that need that will be in the forefront. Uh, you know, in the future. And, uh, you know, just trying to make sure that the province was resilient in, uh, you know, all the changes that were happening. So that, so I was very uh, uh, honored to be appointed as one of the task force members there. And very recently, about um, a year ago, the province initiated a a task force called the Food Security Task Force to look at uh, what's happening in the food uh, security areas in the province, you know, what's happening in the agricultural sector, what kind of innovations are happening. And uh, so I was very happy to be appointed to that task force as well to look at, 
you know, where British Columbia is today and what we need to do over the next, uh, you know, short term, in the next five years, but in a longer term as well to make sure that, uh, you know, we have food security, you know, for the, uh, for the people of, uh, of the province. So, uh, you know, both task forces, uh, we've just recently finished uh, uh, our work and, and the report has uh, recently been uh, released uh, on the emerging economy task force, like it was about three, four weeks ago. So, uh, it's available for public to look at, uh, you know, all of the, uh, deliberations and research and consultations that we did throughout the province and uh, all of the recommendations are uh, in both of those uh, reports. So President CEO of Innovate BC, Governor UBC, member of the task force at the government of British Columbia. And if that's not enough, you're also a member at the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Governor of Hamber Foundation, board member at the ICIC, the India-Canada Innovation Council, and a long list of other companies. So fair to say that uh, you are one of the leading voices when it comes to innovation, when it comes to community building, especially around uh, startups and businesses. How do you find the time to do all of this? You know, uh, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion, all of that is a huge passion of mine. So uh, when um, the chief of uh, British Columbia, VCRCMP, uh, uh, started a um, committee to look into those, uh, to advance uh, uh, those initiatives. I was, uh, you know, again, very honored and happy to be part of that, to to bring my voice, uh, you know, to the table to make sure that uh, we continually make advancements, uh, you know, in that particular space. You know, ment- mentoring and, uh, you know, helping people and building communities and building ecosystems is, again, you know, a huge passion of mine. So when I'm involved in some of the... Uh, other non-profit organizations, as an example, Hemba Foundation, where you know we uh, provide a lot of assistance to uh, non-profits and people in need, um, and I'm happy to do that. I uh, these are uh, again not uh, not full-time jobs, but uh, this you know what I consider is my give back uh, to the community. So I so yeah, I do I definitely you know I'm busy. I try and uh, be very effective and try and help out as much as I can. I feel like you have more than 24 hours a day. I wish. Is that <laughs> some special power that we don't know about? <laughs> you know, we, we just took a look at your, your long list of current and previous projects that you've worked on. If you were to explain to, let's say, someone that you just met or maybe even your parents, how would you describe uh, what you do for a living and what you do for work? Well, for uh, specifically for Innovate BC, you know, I try to be, you know, be fairly specific to to what the organization is and exactly, uh, you know, what we do. So Innovate BC, you know, we're a crown agency of the province of British Columbia that uh, connect provinces, innovators. You know, these are people that are innovating in, in different ways, different things, uh, to funding resources and support they need to start, scale and stay in British Columbia. So the big thing is making sure that anybody has an idea or any sort of innovation, we provide them all of those things so they're able to get that idea into commercial stage, build a company, and stay in British Columbia. And uh, and our work uh, covers um, companies at all stages of growth, so right from idea stage to companies that are scaling, uh, we support companies across all sectors, so we're not uh, in one specific sector. And uh, the big thing that I say to people is that uh, we help companies all over British Columbia. One of the uh, you know confusion, I guess, uh, is because we're based in Vancouver, people think we're only kind of serving the uh, the companies or constituents around the Lower Mainland, but it's not true. Our focus is uh, all of British Columbia, and we do a lot of work uh, in all of the rural areas, regions of British Columbia. What percent of your projects are in Vancouver or the, the Lower Mainland, and and then what percent is uh, outside? Would you say? Right now, fifty percent, uh, uh, approximately fifty percent is in uh, in Lower Mainland, and fifty percent is in the regions. Cool. Uh, working with a lot of different startups. This is a good segue. This is um, going to throw you a curveball here. The, the podcast is named Innovators. I'm just very curious from 
based on your experience and uh, you know all the different projects you've worked with, what does being a good innovator mean to you? It's uh, I mean a good innovator is uh, is somebody you know that has that eye to be able to see an issue you know see a problem and then start thinking of how you can solve that. I mean that's innovation. And sometimes you know people uh, look at innovation as uh, you know building something. It's really not that. You know to me innovation is like I just mentioned there is a problem and. You're all, all, already starting to think about how you can, uh, you can solve that problem. It's basically trying to respond to a change in a creative way. You know, you, you take your idea and you uh, apply it in a, in a novel or a, you know, in a useful way. I mean, that's, uh, to me, you know, that's innovation. And it's all the thinking as well. You know, people uh, that have a you know, new or different way of thinking, people that think about... Uh, and that had never say thought about uh, equity and all of that in in their business or in their personal lives. If they start to think uh, in that term, that's actually innovation as well. So it's it's fairly broad, not just kind of building a uh, uh, you know product or a service. Exactly, because so much of a company's success depends on so many different factors, not just the product, not just the tech, but also the corporate culture, also the strategy. Also, uh, the team that you put into place and the resources that are available. Absolutely, you know, culture is is a very, very important. You know, companies that uh, really prosper and do well and and grow fast. Uh, you know, they if you really dig deep into some of the the reasons why they were successful, it's uh, it's because they created that nice culture right from the early stages. It's hard to be, build you know good culture when you're. Uh, halfway through, but uh, it's much easier to build that culture right at the very beginning and good successful companies uh, have done that. They've been very good at that. Early in your career, uh, you mentioned that you also started your own startup. How were you able to create a, a culture? Uh, your, your, start, your company lasted for uh, more than 20 years before getting acquired. How did you go about building that kind of culture where people will stay and grow with the company? Yeah, that's a very good good question. You know, we uh, and, and and for us, uh, for myself and my business partner, you know, culture was not uh, something was an afterthought. Um, my partner was a very experienced businessman. I had no experience at that time, but uh, he was a great mentor and coach. But and one thing that I remember him saying when we were just the two of us, uh, three of us is that we need to create a, an amazing culture for us to be successful. If you want to be in business for uh, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, then we need to make sure that uh, we start with a great culture to begin with. Uh, one of the things that he said that still resonates to me is if you want to just grow the company and sell it in five years, you probably want to focus on you know, your top line and bottom line and not worry about any of the side things. But if you want the, to, to build and run and grow this company for many, many years, then the culture side is very important, which is so uh, true uh, even today. So what, uh, what we did uh, in, in our organization is for every hire that uh, we made, we wanted to make sure that they felt that they were part of a team, They've, that they felt that they were, uh, they were a part of a family. Very genuinely, you know, things, real small things that we did uh, – you know, created that, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, me learning from my partner mainly is, you know, go, going into the office uh, every morning and going meeting everybody and, uh, you know, saying hi and, uh, you know, having a brief chat about uh, how the uh, evening was last night. You know, just the created that level of trust and respect uh, that uh, people felt, started to feel, um, you know, like like a, like a family. That was just the beginning point. Then uh, we uh, made sure that uh, we focused on different areas, but we did it together. As an example, um, when we were when our company was growing, we were known in the entire country as a company that provided the best service. But that just didn't happen uh, because somebody thought of it. It was a very deliberate effort, effort within our organization, between my partner and myself, and with the team to say, we will go out of way to create this culture 
and and make sure that our customers will be serviced way better than any other companies. Like they should rave about our service, and everybody bought onto that plan, and and it started a culture of great customer service. That was just one thing. And then as we started to grow, and we, our product needed to uh, uh, to be enhanced, we needed to add more products. The second thing we started to focus again collectively, we sat down and said, "Hey guys, you know what? We need to make sure that our product is the best in the market. Let's do. Let's all work together collectively to make sure that this becomes one of the greatest objectives of the company. Everybody's going to do their day to day job, but end of the day, on the customer service, you know, we, we're doing it with our eyes closed. That's perfect. We want to continue that. We want to enhance that. But let's focus on." on the product quality side and they started to build some great amazing products. What was the product that you that you sold by the way? We had a, a enterprise solution for local government so 30 different applications that ran an entire municipality from all of the accounting systems to billing systems, parking tickets, uh, property taxes, utilities and all of building permits. So it was 30 different applications doing different things, but they were all integrated into one thing. So as an example, if you parked a car in Vancouver in the in the wrong place and you got a parking ticket, that parking ticket would actually automatically go into the financial systems. And if you didn't pay, uh, then it will go to the collection system that will take you to the court and all the summons and all sorts. So it was totally integrated solution that a municipality would buy from us. And how large was the company at its peak? We were uh, over 100 uh, people at our peak. Uh, that was in uh, just after 2001. And when you talk about that culture of talking to everyone, that really creates a flat company culture, right? One of the key components of an innovative company. How do you manage being able to create that level of engagement with all 100 of your employees? Yeah, you are right. I mean, we we very uh, intently didn't want to create a huge hierarchy because once you go down to, say, three or four levels, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to talk with them. So for me, as the uh, as the owner, if I needed, if I had five levels and I wanted to talk to uh, to the guy that was coding and, and find out about what his issues were or what he was thinking of innovating, it would become very difficult because... Uh, it just won't allow that. So we tried to keep the organization as flat as possible. And one thing that I made it very clear, or both my partner and I made it very clear, that every employee has full and total access to both of us at any any given time. So it, it gave every employee, no matter what level they were in, that they could come and talk to us, uh, number one. And we, we had a lot of, uh, I would say, you know, little nuances that... Uh, that I don't see happening, you know, these days. As an example, I had lunch. My 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 partner and I had lunch with every employee. So every day we take one employee and we just uh, and it was known in the company. So it wasn't like if I was uh, uh, taking Simon out for lunch, the other people will see what's what's happening. No, we made sure that we would have we would give quality time to uh, to everyone in the organization. So either over coffee or a lunch or um, you know dinner, we would. Uh, we we would we made sure that outside of work, not kind of going and talking to them about uh, you know a new new project or um, new enhancements to make in the software or product or service. This was outside of that, just over coffee or lunch, just talking about themselves and and providing them you know that comfort level about you know the space that they have to think. You know the uh, the freedom that they have to uh, you know make decisions uh, and all of that that coaching that normally happens. So we just made a point of being very connected to our employees. And uh, once we get to 70, 80 people, I know uh, founders uh, or uh, uh, our counterparts in different companies when they, they hear that, what are you guys doing? Like, it doesn't make sense. But for us, it made total sense because we already we always had that connectivity with the people, and then we always had people coming to us. With uh, with great ideas. So, like you, you and your partner would have lunch with me today, and then maybe another a developer on Tuesday uh, or like a Wednesday, and just rotating every single day, and that went from Monday to Friday. 
Monday to Friday, there were times when we, I uh, know we had other uh, commitments, uh, other meetings that we didn't do it, but then we'd have a, uh, you know, nice uh, you know, coffee with uh, with uh, the next person uh, for half an hour, 45 minutes at three o'clock. Uh, but we connected with uh, individuals in that cycle all the time. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, 100 em- employees over the year, uh, any given employees gets to uh, eat with you three times a year. So that's, uh, that's, that's quite nice. Even if they met with us two times a year with for two hours and you know, over that quality time when we were kind of talking about uh, work projects, I, I, I thought that was a real good time to connect, get to know them a lot. And uh, But what I found, the benefit of that was they were so comfortable uh, speaking up coming up with the ideas, whether I was in the meeting or not, they would just, you know, I just, I just get the sense that they were very comfortable in bringing that idea. And one of the key messages that uh, we would talk to uh, our employees outside, this is, you know, the lunch, coffee, uh, you know, dinner meetings was that you can always come up with an idea or suggestion because no idea is a bad idea. We might, and we made it very clear, not everything that you're going to bring up will be taken and implemented, but no idea, no idea that you have is a bad idea. It might not be the right time to implement it. It might not, you know, may not have the right kind of resources or funding to be able to do. Sometimes they would you know, come up and say, you need to uh, go into this specific, say, geography, a different market or something. And we may just in align with the company's uh, strategic plan at the time. So we tell them that, but it wasn't a bad idea. So what we always encourage them is to come up and always keep thinking and bring up ideas because no idea was a bad idea. This is a perfect segue. You're talking about uh, I- different ideas. You know, ideas are great. It, uh, we always people always talk about execution, though. You know, executions is what creates the most successful companies. And we did some research at the Harvard Business Review, and we found that the most innovative companies usually have five things in common, right? They have tolerance for failure, uh, and you're talking about good idea versus bad ideas, Uh, willingness to experiment, freedom of speech, which uh, your previous company did really well, Uh, highly collaborative, and also non-hierarchical. You know, despite the fact that we all know this, these are the, the best types of cultures and the most innovative cultures, but they are hard to create and even more difficult to sustain. How do you go about doing that? Let's say an employee comes up with a very great idea, executes but does it bad does it poorly how do you go about you know this kind of tolerance for failure how do you go about this willingness to experiment and and how do you develop this kind of innovative culture yeah i think first you need to create that environment and it you're right it's not easy because it it takes an effort it's just like uh, you know creating a new market you know it takes effort it takes resources it takes money creating that environment where you know people come feel comfortable to bring up ideas and fee, and also accept that if that idea fails, that's still okay. So, so, so I, we were very deliberate in making sure that we created that an environment. And I talked about a few things. Second thing, we always gave people the space and the time to be creative. You know, in, in our in our organization, I mean, there was the um, in the different sort of departments doing different things. Uh, you know, the graphics team you know, trying to make sure everything kind of looks good. The the software development team making sure that, you know, the product had all the features, um, you know, and then and, and then the implemented implementation team making sure that the customers really understood how to use all the features of the product. But we always made sure that these teams had time, you know, downtime. And, and it was up to the team to decide how they do it. Like, is it Friday afternoon at noon? We're just going to knock off. We're going to have, uh, have uh, you know, some lunch. And then we're just going to um, you know, take an idea and just beat it to death, see if it makes sense. It doesn't affect the work we're doing. It Don't go and and, and muck up, uh, you know, the, the current environment or programs or, or, or product. But go play with it. Just kind of try it out. And then what we found, like, once you create, once you give them that space, that free will, to try things, you know, they would fail a lot, which is totally fine. And I encourage a lot of failure. One thing that I always say, it's always to try something and fail at it, then not try it and not know what would have happened. So always try it out. 
if it doesn't work no problem go on to the next thing and i just so like they were so much fun and our team is did the, the and it's these are small innovation that nobody would, would care about but the message here is like in our products in our service delivery we were so ahead of time and it wasn't because anything that my partner business partner and i uh, did i would tell you probably 95% of those things i had no idea about this was all generated within from the employees but but we provide what we did what i did was created that environment i gave them the space and time i gave them the confidence that you know trying it and failing is better than not trying it at all and i provided a little bit of resources sometimes they needed something and i said you know to do some trial here go ahead and and, and do that and then you know uh, the other the intangibles are you know having creating that uh, you know the comfort zone where people you know feel um uh, open uh, and and feel comfortable to to bring up ideas and thought processes that uh, may not be totally streamlined so you know we 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 always dealt with everybody with a lot of dignity and respect uh, no matter what the idea was and sometimes you know people um come up with things that might sound like so off the of the chart and you know you don't laugh at it you know it's like okay i get it oh i don't get it but it looks like something that you think is great we need to park it you know and that kind of stuff so you always have to you know provide uh, you know that kind of environment for innovation to prosper and i've seen you know good great organizations it all begins with people and and the and the reason they continue to grow and prosper is this lot of internal innovation happening on a daily basis and it's not changing 100% of what they're doing you know from a, you know from this way to the other way but just little things that enhancing the business on a daily basis well you know what as i'm listening to all this it sounds like really it all starts with the leader right the leader creates this culture the leader has his vision for the culture and it's up to the leader to bring it down to the different levels and to the different employees and really to teach and to preach this this kind of tolerance for failure so i'm very curious how did you develop this how did you develop this willingness to experiment and you know even if an employee does a uh, one bad project you're still willing to give them a second third chance how did you develop this tolerance for failure was it from your parents or just from something you learned earlier in your career or from a mentor uh, for me uh, two things one is uh, just uh, my mentor I, i just lucked out to have uh, this amazing uh, uh, business partner who was my mentor who just uh, had uh, been around uh, a lot of businesses a lot of large businesses he had actually worked for large mining companies and stuff like that so he he had a humongous amount of experience which i was able to leverage and and he guided me with a lot of these things about uh, he talked about he talked about creating that environment you know in that time of the its environment or culture where he talked about the environment which uh, which built the cult, that kind of culture within our organization but for me personally you know as i was growing up uh, i grew up in a farm with nothing and when 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 you're in that situation you're always trying things you're always trying things you're not succeeding a lot of times i can tell you that much you probably not succeeding more than 10% of the time but you're always trying things and then once you kind of in that mode right you always um that doesn't go away so for me uh, those were the two things that kind of kept me um you know making sure that uh, you know in my business you know that similar kind of mentality was there and one thing about creating culture you talked about uh, start with the leader i was in a in a hr conference and um, somebody talked about how hr is supposed to create culture I was going to jump up and go to the stage and say you guys are going totally in the wrong direction. HR does not create culture in organization. HR administers it, HR promotes it. The culture needs to start with the leaders. And if you don't want to do that, it's very difficult. It's not going to work. I want to take it back. You were talking about the people It sounds like there's a huge focus on people and also culture uh, in your previous startup and even probably all the other startups that you've uh, mentored and advised in the past. People and culture are sometimes said to be the most important part of the company, more important than the technology or even the industry itself. 
often you put the right team together and anything really is possible. So I'm curious for you, after all these years of experience, how do you recruit and how do you advise your companies to recruit uh, to ensure that people continue to steer the ship towards the right direction? Yeah, I, we had a, a very unorthodox uh, hiring model. And uh, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but that's the model that uh, we had and it uh, it worked for us. Uh, you right, right. I mean, for, for us, it was uh, right from day one that we understood that, uh, you know, it's our people that will uh, either make us successful or uh, or not. And always making sure that we're hiring people that were smarter than us, uh, that fit the uh, the type of jobs that we wanted them to do, uh, you know, we're totally uh, okay with that. The, as far as the hiring policy, we had, a, a, like I said, a little bit of an unorthodox method of hiring. We would, uh, you know, the normal process of uh, analyzing and making sure that we really needed that uh, particular resource, uh, documenting what uh, that particular position needed to do, you know, finding out what kind of, uh, you're not always kind of right on that, but at least trying to uh, put together what kind of experience and education uh, or skill set that particular position needs. And uh, then you go through the, the budgeting process to make sure that uh, it's part of the budget and ongoing budget. And uh, then you go advertise you know, through the normal uh, means. And um, then you uh, look at the, the, all the um, applicants, you shortlist to a certain amount, uh, which mostly... Uh, I did uh, to us to the top five, and then uh, get my partner involved to uh, narrow it down to probably top three phone interviews and all that kind of. This is all kind of regular. But once we got to uh, the uh, individual that we really wanted to hire, then then we changed the process a little bit because we wanted to make sure that our team, especially at that level, the the most senior two or three employees, to have one on one with uh, with this new hire. And uh, we, so we'd bring them in. Uh, these um, you know, senior people would have at least half an hour or 15 minutes of one-on-ones. And then I would bring probably a cross-section of people. So maybe the receptionist, somebody from customer uh, support, somebody from the technical side, uh, five or six people in the room that would just, it's not an interview process anymore, but just kind of have a chit-chat. Too. So this uh, potential employee would talk about who they are, you know, personal stuff, uh, what they like, what they don't like, why why they applied for this company, what they saw uh, in our organization that uh, made them apply. So just have the discussion, and then uh, after all of that said was said and done, then we would solicit this uh, input from these employees, and actually would make the decision based on what we heard. The reason we wanted to do that is we wanted to make sure there was a culture fit. And the only way to figure out if there's a culture fit is to make sure that you get more than one, two, three, or four people involved and talk to them to be able to figure that out. If the team came back and said, this is a great employee, he has all the right kind of skill set, but it won't work, it won't be a culture fit because this is what we've heard, we would not go ahead with hire, no matter how much I like that particular individual. Then we go to the second one. But if they all gave them the thumbs up, then we would continue to uh, uh, hire that particular individual. And what I found, when you do that, you know, those eight people or nine people that had talked with them through that process, m- almost own it, almost make it the priority to make this particular individual successful. So just, it was a great you know, win, win. You know, we, we bring this new guy or girl that you know, becomes fairly successful because everybody wants to. Um, and... Uh, and it's the right culture fit, and it just you know doesn't you know, get the, it doesn't upset the culture within the organization. So that was the process we used uh, for twenty eight years, and I never deviated from the process. And and so even now, as you are advising different startups, different companies, even uh, uh, companies that that were your board members, do you preach these types of ideas, focusing on people and culture? And um, are there any examples of companies that have done it really well recently that you've seen? Um, a lot of companies, actually, uh, too many to probably name uh, or single out, but uh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, when I'm involved with all of this, as an example, MSM is a company, a com- international company that uh, is, uh, is hiring a lot of people. They're hiring you know, 10 people every month, uh, has been for the last, uh, you know, six or seven months. Same thing. 
you know, make sure that, that you have a great culture and make sure that you know what that culture is, make sure that everybody understands that and make sure everybody buys into it. If they don't buy into it, uh, then it doesn't work. So that's, that's the first thing. As, as you, you know, the same kind of thing as you're hiring, you know, this, just try this kind of process to, to make sure that it doesn't upset your uh, culture that you've built. So you kind of enhance as you bring new people in. And I always talk about um, the, the innovation part. A lot of new young companies, when I was talking to them five, six years ago, to say, you know, create, provide that space and time for people to be innovative. But a five person company that's struggling to get a product out, uh, they don't have you know, long runways from funding point of view, from capital point of view. You know, we're not buying into that. Uh, kind of, oh, no, we're too busy. We were working 12 hours a day, so we can't do that. But um, the more and more they started to listen to that, and some of them started to adopt that. Now the, you know, I, I see a shift where they're saying that is absolutely the right way to spend the time. Working more sometimes is not giving the right, the most kind of benefit to the organization. Organization Sometimes working smarter is probably more better than working more. Uh, yeah, sometimes less is truly more. Well, we'd also, we want to open up the floor to you actually to say anything you'd like about uh, Innovate BC. I know you work with a lot of different startups, maybe a cool campaign or initiative that your company has been working on. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, uh, just to briefly, uh, I mean, an organization does a lot throughout the province. I mean, just uh, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but uh, roughly, I would say bit, uh, close to uh, you know 14, 1,500 companies that uh, that we've supported, uh, you know, through uh, some sort of funding or mentorship or uh, or job placements. I, I think uh, over the last year, year and a half. Uh, the companies that we've helped, the 1,400 companies, I think, uh, had uh, about just over 3,000 job placements. That's pretty huge. Um, I think close to 200, 180-some million dollars in revenue were generated by those companies and and about 350, over $350 million of investment those companies uh, attracted. So it's like from the impact point of view, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, impact for a small organization like us uh, that's done. We, uh, as far as uh, you know, some of the programs uh, that uh, that we provide. I mean, we have uh, what we call BC Acceleration Network partners that are uh, set up all around the province. So there's agencies in Nanaimo, uh, Victoria, Prince George, Kamloops, uh, Kootenays, and in, in Trail, uh, Kelowna, and then some in the Lower Mainland. Through them, uh, you know, we provide a lot of mentorship to um, uh, startups. And, and companies that are starting to scale up as well, so kind of trying to build different programs, so continue to help them. We have a lot of many other programs like uh, our Ignite program, where we bring um, you know post secondary researchers um, and uh, and students uh, partnered with a um, uh, industry partner to uh, take a uh, a project research project and make and put that into uh, into commercialization stage. So we fund a lot of those kind of the programs as well. And because of COVID, uh, uh, since March, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've really focused a lot more um, emphasis on making sure that uh, students get placed uh, in companies for uh, helping you know, companies uh, continue to um, operate and uh, you know, digitize and stuff like that. So we, we are putting a lot uh, more money, making sure that... Uh, you know, subsidized companies uh, hiring students so they can uh, have the resources that they need. Brand new uh, program to uh, help students uh, is uh, we're, we're kind of fi finalizing the details right now. So I really can't uh, talk too much about it, but I know, uh, I think uh, a couple of uh, members of my team, Jamil and Radu, are coming uh, to this post podcast in the next uh, week or so. You know what? They should be able to. By that time, we'll have all the details lined out, and they should be. You should ask them about that particular program. Very exciting program to uh, take uh, a lot of our youth uh, and place them into uh, companies in British Columbia. Very exciting. Well, I will leave it there for now. 
for everyone that is tuned in thank you so much for listening and until next time take care be safe and consider checking out innovate bc's accelerator and mentorship programs uh, you can find them at www.innovatebc.ca thanks so much for joining us today ragwa and i uh, look forward to chatting with you more great thank you so much hello everyone this is simon vice president of bcjobs.ca bc jobs is used by hundreds of recruiters and over 200,000 candidates per month. We also run career fairs to help support the jobs market. We regularly run career fairs both in person and virtually with up to 400 candidates per career fair. Visit bcjobs.ca to discover jobs locally and remote.